So you are all a very warm welcome to this um, very special <clears throat> uh, webinar. Uh, it is a webinar organized together with the Open University Catalonia and uh, the International Association of Universities. My name is, as you can see on the screen, Elie Drantland. I'm the Secretary General of the International Association of Universities, a a uh, non-governmental organization based in Paris uh, at UNESCO. And we're very pleased to have launched uh, a few years back a global cluster on HESD. Um, and SDG3, um, uh, Good Health and Well-Being, led by WOC, is very active and is doing extraordinary work to actually address key issues that uh, have come our way, more specifically so also since uh, COVID hit uh, the planet. Uh, so today we have um, uh, excellent speakers with us to address the issue of mental health crisis and how to build resilience um, in a change world. Uh, it is very important to look um, at what is happening all around us and understand how we can actually address the global health crisis that we're facing in many forms and shapes uh, around the world. And that's why we're so uh, honored to have so many speakers from different parts of the world, even at uh, midnight <laughs> uh, from Australia or, or um, earlier in the morning uh, in other parts of the world. So I'm really um, very pleased to be able to draw attention here as well to the importance of this work that's being done and also the new dynamics that we see around the world around the development of e-health uh, dynamics that allow to actually address the growing number of uh, requests for assistance when it comes to a crisis that uh, certainly should not be underestimated. And um, the speakers will uh, be able to tell us much more on how to address it. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Marta Emrich and, uh, and to the Open University Catalonia to open uh, the, um, the debate and the floor to the speakers that we have with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly D, for, uh, for this nice welcome always from the uh, uh, International Association of Universities. So our cluster is an open network with the, uh, right now eight universities. Uh, the speakers that we have today are from these universities. These are Diana Setillawati, Director of the Center for Public Mental Health at Universitas Gajamada in Indonesia, Carlos Contreras, Professor Researcher of the Department of Sociology at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana de Mexico, Mauricio Castaño, Psychiatrist from the Department of Mental Health and Human Behavior uh, of the Universidad de Caldas in Colombia, Tania Peric. Senior Lecturer, uh, School of the of the School of Psychology at Western Sydney University, Dickens Aquina, a Senior Lecturer and Psychiatrist as well, uh, from the Makerere University in Uganda, Sophia Sophia Seinfeld, a Lecturer in the Psychology and Education Sciences Department at the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. So. Having said that, the webinar will aim to look at some individual country contexts and emerging trends in mental health, lessons learned in, uh, su uh, in supporting individuals and communities in coping in uncertain and rapidly changing environments, e-health solutions that have been developed that can play a role in supporting healthcare professionals and the patients, both in prevention and case management, and the specific role of higher education and research in providing and supporting e-health service provision in mental health. So before we start, we would like to hear from you, the audience, on how your university is uh, uh, ad addressing uh, all uh, 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 um, some of the issues around mental health. Please respond uh, using this QR on the screen. We will go back uh, after uh, to the end of the of the webinar. 
So uh, then let me uh, sh let me uh, share with you some housekeeping things, uh, telling about the Q and A function. Participants, all of you can direct the questions to speakers in the Q&A box and interact with each other in the chat. So the Q&A box is for directing your questions to the panelists and the chat uh, is the opportunity you have to interact uh, between, uh, uh, between you or just telling things that you would like to tell or introduce yourself uh, 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 in the chat. So. Uh, having said that, le let me uh, dive right in. So our first speaker, Diana Sitiyawati, we would love to hear about the Indonesian context and your work at Gadya Mada uh, on mental health. Please, uh, uh, Diana. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Am I audible? You can hear me yes. good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good night, everyone. Uh, lovely to meet you all. So I would like to share uh, a bit about Indonesia. So Indonesia is very huge country. A huge country with seventeen thousand island, as you know, and we have a, a strong, according to us, strong health system, which is we, we rely on. Uh, 10,000 or oh, 10,000 uh, primary healthcare clinic, but uh, only a small number of that having uh, mental health services to the community. So mental health is something that really, 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 yeah, emerging in Indonesia. So uh, uh, during the COVID-19, um, People were aware more about the need of the mental health, like or mental health become a trending topic, as maybe in other countries. And uh, we are in Gajah Mada University, which is the biggest university in Indonesia. Uh, first, we are trying to uh, do the screening. Uh, during uh, in the first maybe month of the uh, pandemic to assess the students and we found that very very big uh, proportion of them have a high level of stress and then we provide a, a call center uh, we trying to reach out them uh, privately by email and then we uh, provide a call center to the student. Surprisingly, the only very small number of the student that actually identified as need uh, support uh, reaching back to us. And uh, while the, in the other uh, platform, we are trying to offer them uh, Instagram chatting. Uh, not calling, yeah. So Instagram chatting, which is uh, uh, surprisingly got more response from the students. Uh, so then, uh, uh, after some time, we close down the call center, and then we are thinking of developing uh, something that may be more engaging and more uh, uh, lovable by the uh, student. Then uh, we. Uh, uh, come up with an idea we call it a uh, chatbot and then we uh, develop uh, what we call lintang chatbot lintang is a star but uh, it's also yeah having a meaning in Japanese in Indonesian term which is uh, 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 like uh, we are trying to provide support in a quick manner or something like that so uh, <clears throat> the chatbot that we are developing uh, uh, having an uh, aim for uh, doing the early detection uh, support, or like, uh, just a support like like uh, yeah like psychological first aid yeah and then uh, and then uh, emergency emergency response which is like uh, the chatbot uh, we train the chatbot to refer if there is a sign of emergency and also. Uh, uh, literacy, mental health literacy. So we also provide uh, education uh, through the child, but if they just like maybe uh, just uh, want to uh, know something like that. So 
that currently we are providing this service a uh, bit by bit we train the 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 chatbot because the chatbot is based on the in, uh, artificial intelligence and and uh, it is it is hard to, to make the the chatbot very smart because we have sometimes uh, what we identified as a complaint then uh, people come out with another complaint and the chatbot is just go silent because because we don't train them yet so as currently we are developing and uh, iterative uh, in iterative manner and we are uh, trying now to uh, integrate it integrate the the chatbot with the whole system in in Gajah Mada University, uh, with the all the services that we are trying to provide. So uh, for your information, in Indonesia actually we have 339 e-health uh, since 1985, but it is not uh, not only mental health for everything. And the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, come uh, as a catalyst for this. Uh, yeah, is the development of this e-health, and currently we are having um, more than ten mental health services through uh, e-health uh, all around Indonesia. That's that's the development uh, so far. So maybe that's uh, already six minutes. Please. So maybe I hand it over to, back to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Diana, for sticking to the time. This is very, very, very respectful to the others. Uh, and I love your idea about yeah, the transition to the call center, to the chatbot, and how to train the chatbot to be as part. That that was uh, really very interesting. Now we are move, moving on to another part of the globe. Now uh, we are going to Mexico, and uh, Carlos Contreras from, from the Universidad Autónoma uh, Metropolitana de Mexico will to will talk about the post-COVID uh, Mexican uh context and how after the pandemic uh, uh, they, they are some kind of community support around it. Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to uh, stay here with you. Uh, here uh, is a very uh, pleasant day to be uh, sharing these uh, ideas with the public. Uh, let me introduce some uh, previews or pre-pandemic uh, ideas uh, we have, I think, in the world, I don't know, but uh, in Mexico in particular. Uh, they, um, we all know uh, that uh, social trust and trust in government is very important. Uh, uh, we are uh, in a period of transformation and change, so uh, the institutions are, uh, very, uh, are challenged to provide uh, different uh, uh, narratives and services um, uh, with quality and cover and coverture. Um, uh, the pandemic, the uh, COVID pandemic, hits us in this transition. So uh, when uh, the uh, health services um, uh, nearly collapsed, as in the other parts of the world, we were uh, uh, we. Uh, rest a lot in uh, social support and family support. So uh, uh, in Mexico, it was very important how the families and the institution, the local institutions uh, were uh, uh, begins to, to support the uh, transition from uh, no, nobody knows what's happening to uh, we are uh, able or capable to deal with this uh, problem, with this uh, challenge. Uh, so uh, the uh, Metropolitan University uh, supports uh, the, their community, uh, his community, and also the uh, community around Mexico City. As you probably know, Mexico City is a, a macro uh, city. It's a um, mega city that uh, has a lot of uh, different inequalities. So you have this uh, central and occidental parts uh, and Mexico is uh, also, as uh, the Mexico City uh, place, a very uh, unequal uh, uh, venue. We have these uh, places with uh, 
slums and poverty, and we have this uh, highly globalized and competitive uh, parts in Mexico City. And we have, the, as university, how to uh, build these uh, social uh, supports more in the uh, logic of we are also we are all in this problem. This is not a problem of rich and poor. We need to uh, work together to uh, uh, respond to the social emergency. Uh, in the Metropolitan University and also other, other universities in Mexico City, like UNAM and Polytechnic and other, uh, were very, very important in building this uh, community, the sense of community uh, through different projects. Like, by example, uh, some batches were uh, applied, were uh, the, um, dispensed uh, in, inside the universities as uh, places to, to uh, vaccinate a, a lot of people, a lot, really a lot of people. In other places, uh, in my university in particular, we uh, offer these uh, uh, mental health uh, uh, telephone lines and also chats, and also uh, this um, project of in uh, terms of uh, education in mental health. We uh, build these uh, um, web pages and sites and um, uh, groups of people behind this trying to uh, respond to the crisis and also to the great to uh, prevent a uh, crisis uh, and uh, upsets. Uh, Mexico uh, have a re relatively uh, no so good uh, responses in terms of um, the, the impacts. Uh, we have around uh, a million of people who uh, die because uh, they uh, a lot of people here have uh, preconditions, no? uh, uh, things like diabetes, things like hypertension was uh, very important. But in terms of mental health, uh, I think we do, we did a little uh, uh, acceptable uh, response, not only be because the universities and other institutions, <clears throat> uh, federal and local institutions, but also because the families and the local communities respond uh, in terms of trying to support and uh, extend these uh, links of uh, companion to uh, not just the students, but also their families and or the uh, workers, the uh, people around the, the connected in some way with the universities. Uh, we uh, built also different platforms uh, now uh, powered by uh, artificial intelligence also, but also uh, in terms of um, uh, retraining uh, people that was uh, trying to help in the uh, other, older ways or maybe not so uh, actualized ways. And uh, universities also offer uh, courses and uh, training to people uh, who are uh, just trying to he uh, help in terms of, by example, thanatology and uh, first uh, aids in mental health. Uh, Thank I think, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Are you coming to an end uh, for this first? Yes. Uh, last, yeah. last statement <laughs> is that I um, think the resilience uh, is a now a very accepted word. Uh, people are clear what resilience means and how is the uh, how is the institutional and university uh, role in this uh, resilience uh, building. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a, a, a nice meeting point in the university talking about social trust and resilience and how to engage with the community. Thank you very much for this. Uh, um, these examples, it's good practice. And now let's move on to uh, uh, to Colombia. Uh, Mauricio Castaño Ramirez, who is a psychiatrist, will talk about one specific project at the University of Caldas. Uh, so um, Mauricio, uh, 
Thank yeah, you for you have. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, uh, I'm going to talk uh, in this few minutes about the context of Colombia and as the project. Yeah. So as you know, Colombia had a long history of armed conflict. So before COVID-19, some areas in Colombia, specifically remote areas, uh, rural areas, uh, or remote areas for mainly cities, experienced the effects of armed conflict. Yeah. So we had a complicated situation like sexual violence, kidnapping, drug trafficking, massacres, and minor recruitment that increased the rates of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders, mainly in rural areas. Moreover, Colombia, like other countries around the world, experienced other conditions like social inequality, social inequalities that uh, that set up a social outburst, yeah? And when COVID came to Colombia, uh, these conditions uh, get worse, yeah? But not all is bad in Colombia. Uh, on the other hand, we had a health system that had one principle that is solidarity, yeah? In this system, all legal residents in Colombia have access to basic and specialized health service. In mental health service, anyone independent of the of their income, of their income can access to psychotherapy by psychiatric, psychotherapy by psychologic, substance use disorders, treatments, and hospitalization in psychiatric clinics. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you have uh, money or the, you don't have, because all people. Uh, have the same uh, insurance and they have uh, the same benefits to access at the at the health system. When COVID nineteen came to Colombia, some conditions like lockdown schools and social distance uh, promote other conditions like domestic violence, stress, and an increase in substance misuse. After pandemic. There has been an increase of you of the use of mental health service, yeah? nearly of 30% of mental health service increased their attentions uh, for conditions that like I said before. Yeah. And the rates of depression and suicide attempts and suicide are worse now than before the pandemic. Yeah. In an attempt to to improve these conditions, uh, in Caldas University, we are implementing some alternatives to, to reach out more coverage in remote zones. zones. Uh, we are implementing telemedicine in rural areas with limited infrastructure and especially those with no access to internet. Uh, we are developing an app to screen mood state and we are developing or we're implementing in adolescents that is the a population more affected after pandemic. Uh, we are implementing the uh, three-way therapies uh, to adolescents with problems and with problems related with substance use. Now we had a program that uh, have two kinds of psychotherapies. One is acceptance and commitment therapy, and the other is uh, mindfulness therapy. We are comparing the efficacy of both therapies in the in a program that the name is Vivo or Life or Vivo, like a Vivo, the movie of, of, of Brazil. And this philosophy of these therapies, uh, especially the mindfulness, include the concept developed by John kabat with some aspect of, more of oriental mindfulness to improve the insights in body, the insights in mind, and insights in spirit in adolescents. Yeah? This program consists of 12 sessions where patients learn to practice mindfulness techniques like body scan, consciousness of their emotion and thought, and try to detect the values that guide their lives. Yeah? These psychotherapies also include uh, an education in detection of risk factors and the detection of problems related with the substance abuse. This program is directed to adolescents uh, with poor conditions, Adolescent that doesn't have uh, their parents, uh, a consequence of the violence or consequence of domestic violence, and um, at the end, we are comparing the efficacy of both therapy to get um, 
uh, some kind to who will be benefit to personalize psychotherapies, yeah? Because we are trying to uh, to characterize the people or the patient and to find who is benefit for mindfulness, who is benefit for ACT therapy, or who will be benefit of another uh, condition of another kind of hospitalization. At the end, uh, our project is trying to create a novel intervention to figure out uh, problems related with substance use disorders in adolescents. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. That uh, that was very interesting to know from uh, how social inequality can be reduced regarding yeah, the uh, access to health services thanks to uh, the uh, intervention of a university. So that, that was very helpful. And uh, now we can uh, ask, I would like to ask you uh, to uh, the three speakers that we already have, uh, it related to depression and and uh, and and, uh, and anxiety, for instance, or uh, because they are these the most prevalent um, mental health issues. But you have touched it uh, on this already in your talks. But uh, what do you think? What are some of the best ways that we can increase community resilience to prevent uh, some of the these mental health issues, um, um, as I mentioned, maybe anxiety of the or depression, which are the most prevalent prevailing ones in the society and also of, for sure in the universities too. Who who would like to answer first, Carlos, Mauricio, or Diana? Diana, maybe. Maybe, Go ahead, yeah. Diana. Okay. Uh, I think if you ask about the uh, prevention, uh, we uh, we just finished a kind of uh, research um, uh, in Indonesia that we found that uh, multi level multi level approach is the best thing to prevent depression. So depression in uh, uh, especially in in young people uh, what I mean by multi-level is uh, a community resilience a family resilience and individual resilience so uh, we need to act as uh, as comprehensive as possible and we found that family actually have a very significant uh, role to contribute that we also did a research during the pandemic, which is uh, so uh, in, in a country like my country, Indonesia, while we can re really rely on government or health system at that time. So family become a very, very much a big bone or the only resources for mental health. So, so we actually in the normal situation, we should equip family and we should empower family to become a, a, a primary support for, for the member to prevent the depression and anxiety, especially in the time of emergency. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was very interesting, the, the concept of multi-level resilience uh, going from individual, family, and community and having the family as a big hub between the individual and the community. That That's very interesting. Uh, Carlos or, or Mauricio, uh, would you like to add something on it? Yes. So we have in Colombia a big problem because we there's an increase in suicide attempts, yeah, in a 30% in the last year, yeah, and depression because all conditions that I said before. And I think that uh, it's necessary that uh, everyone uh, work together in community to improve these conditions, yeah? And like uh, I am a psychiatrist and a psychiatrist and psychologist, uh, we can uh, get or get some intervention or individual intervention or group intervention, but uh, we only interve make intervention in, in the biologics, conditions, for example, in depression, we can use antidepressants or anxiolytics, and we can use psychotherapies, but we need other conditions that is necessary that governments and universities uh, 
take that in account for in account for example uh, we need to diminish to to solve the inequalities yes we need to solve the poor access to mental health services uh, for example in rural areas is more difficult yeah we have we have access to to psychotherapies but in rural areas is more difficult so we need to improve this condition we need to improve the inequalities in the society but this is a work for our governments or for politicians yeah so in conclusion we need local intervention by psychiatry by psychology social workers etc and general intervention but changing in politics to uh, improve the inequalities yeah Again, thank you. This multi-level interventions, local and general. Yeah, that, that's uh, a good synthesis. Thank you. And, and Carlos, uh, uh, what would you like to add to that? Yes, uh, from a social psychologist uh, point of view, I will uh, point to the uh, term that uh, resilience is also learned by example. We need uh, better uh, models and uh, uh, bigger uh, learning to uh, uh, try to understand that resilience is not just a product, but also a process. Uh, resilience is mainly a thing that uh, we can or cannot see because other people are uh, uh, going through different challenge and uh, aiming at higher, higher goals. Uh, we uh, in the during, during the pandemic we have this uh, lowering of optimism and self efficacy and a lot of uh, uh, skills and uh, ideas uh, beliefs that uh, helps us to to go through dark times. We need better examples. We need uh, uh, TikTokers and uh, influencers and social media. Uh, people going to this uh, uh, reinforcing of uh, uh, different skills and different uh, uh, results that are uh, related to resilience. We need to, to improve the communication between uh, members, important members of the community, especially with uh, young people. I agree with my colleagues. Now the problem or the challenge is to go uh, through these uh, tools, uh, to this media, social media especially, to young people. Thanks a lot. That's uh, a conclusion uh, or a common a common uh, uh, ar argument that you mentioned uh, uh, or ch a common challenge uh, the uh, adolescents and the, and the youth. Uh, so, uh, and Having that in mind, bearing that in mind, I I think about technology that you just mentioned, Carlos, about the social media, and uh, that brings me to think about digital health and e-health. And uh, I was about to ask you, uh, what role do you see in e-health uh, e playing in that? But in a way, you already mentioned it in your questions. And we have here uh, the uh, the nice uh, uh, presence, I mean, the, the uh, uh, in uh, uh, of a, uh, a university in Western Sydney in Australia that uh, telehealth and health and is really white. Uh, spread and uh, they have a, a, a very big experience uh, regarding it and uh, uh, for uh, we have this uh, immense uh, 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 kind of a privilege to have Tanya Perry, uh, Perry with us uh, from the School of Psychology and uh, uh, we are Moving from very early in the morning in Colombia and Mexico, and then, and then I would like to give the floor to very well. I was very about to early. say very late and not very very early, very early because very early so, uh, <laughs> to to it, it's uh, for uh, for um, one a.m. almost at one a.m. in the morning in in Sydney. So, Dani, I will move the floor to you, and uh, we will we are thrilled uh, to know. Uh, about the uh, 
uh, Australian context and the e-health, what the, what's the role uh, of e-health in, in mental health uh, and resilience? Uh, so go ahead. Thank you, Dania. Thank you so much, Marta. That was a lovely introduction. Um, I'll just give a little bit of the context of what has been happening in Australia in terms of e-health and specifically telehealth. Um, so what happened for us here during COVID was the Australian government became very supportive of the use of delivering mental health services via telehealth platforms. So platforms like Zoom, um, and we also have other specific programs here in Australia like CoView, um, these are things that were support supported through Medicare. And that meant that patients could get money back from the government for seeking mental health support. So they did a massive increase in the amount of sessions that people were able to attend. Um, the federal government helped people attend up to 20 sessions with a psychologist. So that was really exciting. Uh, and what they've done post COVID is maintain rebates um, using telehealth. So clinicians that are working with telehealth and working with clients are still able to use Zoom, CoView and other telehealth platforms and get Medicare rebates. So that's something that's been very exciting um, for us in Australia. Um, some of the research work I do looks at people living with bipolar disorder. Um, so for the population that I work with, being able to access telehealth and deliver mental health services using this platform is really important. Um, because it means that we can access and deliver programs to people that are living in rural areas. Um, as you know, Australia is a big country. Um, we're very big and people are living all across the country. Um, so what that means is that people often are not able to access the same type of mental health services as they are in the city, um, just because they're so far away. Um, so some of my research has been looking at the acceptability and feasibility of um, the delivery of um, bipolar disorder group therapy programs um, using telehealth. Um, some of the other work that I'm interested in, and I'll talk about this a little bit as well, because I think the group uh, and the participants might be particularly interested in this, is I have been very interested in the real world use of e-health. Um, particularly in young people. Um, I'm also a lecturer. I have a student population that I teach and I was very interested in our student population and their use of apps, websites, forums and other digital platforms to support their mental health and wellbeing. Um, again, in Australia, we have a lot of government support um, that funds the development of apps. Um, a lot of randomised control trials have been conducted looking at the efficacy of certain types of apps for treating depression, enhancing resilience. Um, so we have a lot of funding that goes into that. But I was really interested in are the young people actually using it? Um, so that was some of the research that I was really interested in, um, particularly now post-COVID. Um, I think that what is interesting with young people and their use of um, digital health is that it's much lower than what I would expect. Um, we know that young people have very high levels, particularly of anxiety, depression and stress. Um, in our student sample, most of the, the mean scores were in a clinically significant range. So despite our mean scores being within a clinically significant range, they're still not obtaining treatment either face-to-face -face or using digital platforms like apps or websites. What I thought was particularly interesting, and I, I'm just looking at my data here, I put it up because it, just in case I'd forget, um, but we, I surveyed over a 1,000 um, students um, and asked them about their use of online technology for mental health reasons. Um, so around 64% had used any type of platform, 33% had used apps, um, but only 6% had used any online mental health program. Um, so these are programs that have had a lot of funding in getting them up and running, getting them developed. And you probably are aware of a lot of these programs. They're usually structured CBT style programs that guide people week by week using um, a web interface. Um, what we thought was very interesting. So in terms of the app use, mindfulness apps were easily the most popular apps. Um, most young people had downloaded and used mindfulness apps. 
What we found very interesting was that the young people would use the apps, but they wouldn't necessarily keep using them. Um, so even though they would endorse that they'd use them at any point in their lives, um, they were not often using them regularly on a regular basis. And I guess we know what that's like. We download an app, it sits on our phone, we plan to use it, maybe we use it, maybe we don't, we get bored of it very quickly. And that seems to be something that we're seeing in our data as well. Um, young people initially using it and engaging with it, but perhaps losing interest um, over time. So maybe that's enough, Marta. I, I wasn't really looking at time at all. <laughs> I was just kind of You're, talking. So hopefully perfect, that's... Perfect. It's that perfect. It's just uh, 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 just a few seconds to finish. Uh, so oh, it, it was it was perfect. It's, so in, it's very interesting and how the connection with mindfulness uh, from the Universita de, Cal, uh, de Caldas, uh, how, they, uh, how they use it and how it was so popular in the apps and it, uh, it is really surprising uh, the, the low uh, percentage to use a, the online platforms and uh, uh, the, 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 the knowledge you bring us, uh, it's really important to take action on that. Thank you. And, and now we are, we are going to move to uh, Uganda uh, in Africa, uh, Deacon Zakina, uh, uh, from, uh, she's a psychiatrist from Makere uh, University, and uh, uh, we'll discuss about the uh, Ugandan uh, context uh, post COVID. So, um, is, uh, is he. There's nothing here? Okay. She's not here. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. She 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 had some some problems. Then uh, we will move to um, uh, to to Sophia uh, Seinfeld. Uh, Sophia uh, will focus more specifically a, in the in the Catalan Spanish uh, context and how Catalan universities are uh, using virtual reality. So Sophia, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Marta. So yeah, so basically in my six minute intervention, I. I want to explain to you a little bit how an, an emerging technology might play a role in the future of uh, e-health and telehealth. This technology is virtual reality. So first, I, I just want to give you a very uh, quick background on the technology, on how it has evolved in the last few years, and then give you a couple of examples of how we have used it here in, in Barcelona, Spain. So, so basically, extended reality technologies such as virtual reality and augmented reality started being researched and developed uh, around the 90s, well, uh, at least in psychology. And from, from these first studies from the 90s, we know that it's a quite powerful tool within therapy uh, because people can experience a very strong sense of presence in virtual reality. This means that people feel as if they are really inside the virtual environment, despite they know that uh, it's not real, that it's completely uh, virtual. So this might provide quite experiential experiences within treatments that we don't necessarily deliver uh, in person. Uh, the hardware used to provide these uh, experiences, just to show you, is this type of uh, virtual reality headsets that I have here in my uh, camera. And, and for instance, if we put someone with a, a very high fear of heights inside a, a virtual reality scene, depicted in an elevator or a, a heights scenario, normally this person will experience a very strong physiological reaction uh, related to anxiety. And this is why one of the first uses of the technology in the 90s was for exposure therapy uh, for phobias, showing uh, very high effective, effect, effectiveness, uh, which is comparable to in vivo uh, exposure uh, therapy. So the hardware for, cre for creating these virtual reality experiences used to be very expensive, but uh, approximately four, four or five years ago, around COVID pandemic, 
uh, VR headsets have uh, entered to the consumer market. Uh, they're more affordable and each time more uh, ergonomic. Uh, so uh, as this industry grows, uh, VR is becoming cheaper and more powerful, despite there is still not a mass adoption of the technologies. However, there are some experts that say that this time will come, people will have this type of uh, VR headsets at home or other type, but similar. Uh, and for sure, if we use it for the right purposes, they uh, might benefit um, psychological interventions. So for, for instance, just to give you some examples, some examples more in the international uh, scene, there are, there are already people trying to combine the use of these immersive virtual uh, scenarios with uh, conversational agents based on uh, artificial intelligence, based on chat GPT or, or others. And they try to simulate uh, not only patients, which helps to train uh, healthcare professionals, but also to simulate uh, therapists in order to provide psychological uh, therapies in a more automated manner. And of course, in-person therapy and having a physical therapist, uh, it's like the best treatment we can deliver. But as we know, we, we have a very high demand as uh, the other panelists have shown in the different uh, countries, right? We have a, a, a very high demand in the healthcare systems, and we are not able uh, to, to, to provide healthcare to all these cases, right? So there is now this view that automated therapies might be uh, the future in some regard, and virtual reality probably will play a role there. In the case of Barcelona and Spain, for example, we have done some extensive research on how to use these type of technologies uh, to decrease uh, racial biases or to improve the treatment of domestic violence. So through the use of virtual reality, we can also put uh, people uh, virtually in the shoes of uh, other type of uh, persons. So for example, we have done experiments where we put light skin participants in dark skin virtual bodies and we have found that this might decrease their implicit uh, racial biases. And in collaboration with the Catalan Justice Department, we have also uh, developed some tools that allow offenders that have committed a crime of intimate partner violence to put themselves in the perspective of, uh, in this case, male offenders in the perspective of a female victim of uh, domestic violence. And we have shown that this might help them improve their emotion recognition uh, skills, and that it also uh, provides inputs inputs to group therapy where they can discuss these type of experiences that people like feel in their own skin and they're more experiential and so on. So I think that this is a technology that uh, for sure might play a role in the in the future of e-health and, and yeah, telemedicine. Tele, telemedicine. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for for this uh, uh, view, trying to deep into the future <laughs> in a way. Uh, and thank you all for uh, for your uh, sticking to the time. I I know that this is a time pressure when you have a lot of uh, a lot of ideas and projects to uh, to communicate. And uh, I'm all the time saying let's stick to a, a few a few minutes. And I, I like to. Now uh, I would like to interact between you, uh, between you, and especially the last two speakers. But also, if you wanna uh, jump in the first uh, three speakers, I would like to know uh, what do you consider, uh, since all of you, as the it it was one of the. Um, objectives of the one of the goals of the webinar the e-health uh, how can contribute to the uh, to the mental health um, uh, solving uh, problems uh, what what is the right balance between uh, in-person and e-health delivery I know for sure this is not a quantitative uh, response that you have in mind, but I, we, I would like you to uh, uh, 
bring about your experiences regarding this balance. Uh, maybe, uh, Tania, since you have a long experience in your country about it, you, you can start and then uh, Sofia, you can uh, jump in and or Diana, Carlos, Mauricio, uh, uh, in the order you like. I think so much of it depends on the client and their needs and and I think for us it's really about meeting the client where they're at and if that's in a technology space then I think we develop and cultivate that. I have some clients who don't want any technology in their young people and they really want the face-to-face -face contact. Um, I have other clients that only want technology. They don't want any face-to-face. -face. They're very comfortable with technology. So I think it just really depends, Marta. So I don't know if that answers the question. Um, I don't know if it's a population thing or an individual thing. I don't know. Uh, but maybe yeah, it is, uh, it's a kind of white and black. I mean, the, the sometimes there's something that can be mer merge uh like uh, like we are doing in our uh day-to-day -day lives i mean uh, i'm mm -hmm. usually communicating for via whatsapp uh, to my family but also uh i uh spend some time uh, uh having fun with them uh either virtually or uh, uh, face to face. And uh, sometimes people say, well, um, regarding e-health, maybe it's something that we can combine. Uh, I, I can be close to uh, my psychologist and uh, learning how to use this app uh, for or this virtual, virtual reality uh, tool in order to uh, combine uh, both of them uh, uh, that's that's my my impression uh, that's not it's not really a black and white uh, uh, thing uh, but I, uh, I, and uh, you answered it uh, perfectly it depends uh, it depends <laughs> on the situation yeah because it's always the same that if you have the person in the center, uh, then we have to uh, bear in mind their preferences, not only their uh, health uh, characteristics, uh, but also or especially uh, uh, his or her uh, preferences. And that includes technology, how they really manage with technology. It's like any other treatment, I would say. Uh, sometimes if you prefer uh, to take uh, that or that in that way or do you prefer in the mornings or in the uh, it's something that we have to uh, take into account uh, Sophia maybe you can add something to that yes I, I agree with what you both said no I think that taking it to, into account the, the personal needs and, and personal futures of the, 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 the patient is very very important and I and I believe that if that person is open to technologies, uh, these hybrid approaches of maybe doing some parts face to face in person, but also uh, using these technological tools to deliver part of the therapy uh, remotely, it's quite uh, powerful, and it also helps people that might have, you know, as in Australia, distance difficulties to get to you know, to to the office of the therapist or even that have difficulties because of their personal family situations and so on. So so for sure, no? Now the, the question that, that many experts are making now is that we have, at least in Spain, for example, we have a, a very high number of the population that want to access mental health services and they, they cannot access them, right? And, and in that case, when we cannot even provide one session of face-to-face -face interaction uh, with a psychiatrist or a professor or a psychologist, whether we should find methods of providing automate completely automated therapy or not, right? I, I don't know whether this would be good or, or bad, but for sure it's a big uh, debate uh, nowadays and we will see what happens in the near future. 
Thanks. And uh, regarding the part of the building resilience and uh, considering also that uh, you have been talking about domestic violence, for instance, uh, and uh, another issue that usually that is usually raised regarding, for instance, artificial intelligence on the gender biases that we have in the uh, algorithms, because we we have these gender biases in our day to day life, then we uh, translate it into the into the algorithms. Uh, regarding resilience in and in, in the communities that uh usually women are for instance less engaged in participating or uh what do you think uh uh what we can do to reduce uh, these gender biases that we already have in 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 healthcare and also in in technology uh so and we we know that uh, regarding mental health there are uh, women are have uh more prevalence uh, of anxiety and depression than men and uh, we 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 should uh, look for uh, that uh, conditions and differences, gender uh, differences, and how we can, what we can do, what we need to be uh, considering to reduce uh, the gender biases that we already have uh, in other uh, um, uh, sections or, or in other uh, in other parts in education or in other parts uh, uh, of our life. Um, well, I think um, I've noticed in a lot of my research that I have very low participation rate of men taking part in telehealth um, research studies, and I also have a lot of very few men taking part in online research as well, looking at um, anything online. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I know that I've got colleagues who struggle to get male participants to take part in their research in other areas like suicide, understanding the impact of suicide on families. Um, we know that men are using technology, um, and I don't know if using gamification or um, providing support in platforms where men like to be in, like online gaming, um, jumping into all these different, I don't even know what the games are, Marta. <laughs> I'm not, I don't play them, <laughs> but um, I don't know if that's an option. I don't know if we need to develop more gender-specific interventions or is that maybe taking it too far? Um, I know that sometimes people don't feel comfortable with too much of a focus on gender identity and then developing mental health conditions around that. So I think there's a lot of questions we need to ask ourselves around what do we develop um, for who and how targeted should something be and then in what platform should we deliver it because the options are endless, I, I guess. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what Sophia thinks. Yeah, that that's helpful. I mean, in academia, we we work by uh, uh, trying to put to post questions on on our research. So that's that's good to have all these questions in mind in order uh, to uh, address them uh, and try to uh, reduce it. Uh, maybe uh, Sophia, uh, you you can add something, or Mauricio, that you also talked about um, um, domestic violence. Maybe you can add something to that. I have worked, unfortunately, I have worked more when the problem is already there and the strategies we are applying are more focused on treatment, but not on prevention. But for sure, if we talk about prevention, I think we need to tackle the problem from the start, uh, like doing interventions with, you know, very young children's families in education, because if not at, at the end, you know, if if all this ideology uh, evolves until the un until adulthood, then what we are trying to do is sort of 
fix the 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 problem somehow, right? But uh, I do think that uh, interventions with uh, young people and families are the key in order to try to really find a solution to these type of uh, problems. Great. Uh, that, that that's that's a good. Uh, I would uh, I would uh, I would thought to have in mind. Yeah, Mauricio, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that to prevent violence, uh, we need to to create a big campaigns. Uh, for example, in in my country, there's a lot of campaigns for drinks or beverage, but the campaigns for prevent violence, domestic violence, or sexual abuse, are very small. Yes. So I think that we need to get a big campaign to prevent that because uh, the people don't know that violence, domestic violence and sexual abuse is a, a, big, a great risk factor for depression and anxiety. Yeah. Uh, in my experience, I saw many women. I work in a clinic with, uh, with my patients that are women and 60 to 70% of, of the, of the women had uh, a background of sexual abuse or violence domestic yeah so uh, i always think that we need to to prevent that but we need a big campaign in i don't know in the in the world yeah to prevent violence against women against children uh, because uh, it has a, a harmful consequence in the in the life yes the people sometimes the people say i prefer that uh, they killed me than sexual abuse, yeah, because uh, it's a violation of their dignity, yeah. So it's very difficult for women and for children to to suffer that. Thanks, thanks for 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 this contribution. Um, I I I will move uh, to the the Q and A. Uh, box that uh, uh, we have some questions uh, from from you, and then I will love to have enough time uh, for for the audience to uh, to be answered by the the panelists. So uh, let me switch to the first question. And the first is to uh, the first question is is to Diana Diana Setiwawati from Gajamada University. Diana. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, there's a question regarding uh, how the Korean wave impacts society, mental health of the young people in Indonesia. Do you have any observation on that subject? Korean wave? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's a kind of, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, I, no specifically doing research on that, but I supervise some uh, undergraduate research, uh, which is uh, uh, investigate and how uh, how young people in Indonesia take it very seriously. Uh, they are they are like fan of something, and even there is a war between uh, between one one uh, fandom and. Another. So, like, if you are a fan of uh, one band and the other having, <laughs> they they have Thai war, they they have fun war, they have things which is I think make uh, keep the young people busy and maybe at some point not too healthy for them. And also uh, uh, the phenomena of suicide that uh, they they usually that they usually. Uh, uh, do it, yeah. Also impact, uh, like copycat something like that, in in uh, among Indonesian young, uh, fan. That's what my observation. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you for your question, Lydia. Too. There's another question from Carlos Urrutia, and uh, he's asking. He's uh, um, it's uh, in general. Uh, uh, he 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 doesn't mention any panelists, so I guess you can uh, answer any of you. So uh, he's interested if uh, there is if is there 
evidence related to the use of social media to empower or build resilience in communities? And if so, uh, what would be the profile of the influencers like? Uh, if, you if you are aware of any evidence or study or you know any experience regarding that, you can comment on that uh, to answer Carlos Urrutia. Maybe Carlos, do you? Oh, oh Tania. Oh. Yeah, I can uh, speak to this. I have done some research on this. It, it has been very limited. Um, I haven't really looked specifically at um, the idea of building resilience, but we have looked at how different mental health conditions are portrayed in different platforms and how people engage with content. So I have had some students look at TikTok um, eating disorder content on TikTok, um, how um, users respond to that. I think there is scope and I know there is a lot of movement, particularly in Instagram, around positive mental health messaging. Um, and I have an Instagram account and I follow all of those. <laughs> so I know that they're all out there. Um, whether or not they build resilience and what that looks like, I'd like to do more research on that. Um, so, Carlos, it's something I'd like to look at maybe in the next couple of years. Um, so, yeah, I haven't actually got an answer. Sorry, Marta. I just started talking out loud. <laughs> um, but, Matt. yeah, I'd like to look at that because I think it's interesting. It's an interesting question. Yeah, definitely. Again, uh, questions drive our our knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Have, Mauricio, have, go uh, ahead. Yeah. Uh, in Colombia, uh, we have a prevention campaign uh, that the name is to, break, to prevent is two acts, yeah? It's a, a prevention for suicide. And we put this campaign um, in the in September, in the suicide day, yeah? International Suicide Prevention Suicide Day, in September, October. And we saw that many patients or many people uh, follow the hashtag and many people say that thanks for the hashtag because we asked to my mom, we asked to my family and we, uh, get out there afraid to ask to something that what do you what do you uh, what do you are what why do you think why do you think in suicide and we have a lot of comments in the in Instagram and in the hashtag yeah so it will be helpful and I think that is uh, some kind of resilience or to improve resilience through this campaign. Thanks, very I interesting. Will add, uh, I will add. I will add. Sorry that uh, we need a lot of research, as was mentioned. We are uh, creating a, a special program to research uh, mental health and these uh, new uh, questions uh, it's emerging. But we know a lot of how uh, social network analysis can be done. We need to recognize that uh, an influencer that is connected to a, another influencer is uh, twice it or is potentially uh, its uh, impact. We need to recognize that uh, people have uses uh, social media also to uh, connect. So uh, people, uh, to, as uh, psychologists probably know, the uh, influences of uh, the, the work in, on influence from Cialini and the power of uh, connection in communities. So we we know a lot uh, and have a very strong hypothesis that we can uh, prove uh, in this group or another uh, uh, networks of psychologists or researchers in mental health, and we expect that uh, um, people uh, around, especially young people, can be uh, positively influenced by the tools we have now in social science. Thank you. Uh, um, Mauricio, you were about to say something. I, I say your hand. No. Okay. Uh, then, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let, let's, uh, uh, Carlos I, uh, Urrutia, uh, I know you have another question for Tania, but uh, let me ask uh, an, another question first uh, uh, from Iwan Setayawan. Uh, uh, is 
uh, asking about the university setting. Uh, it's for all of you. Uh, how far here of a students is used as part of supporting system in addition to supporting infrastructure provided by the university? And does any you any of you have has a, a, an experience regarding peer uh, uh, students? Diana, maybe. Yeah, uh, in Gajah Mada University, especially, uh, we currently starting the that uh, to have lots of uh, a peer peer counselor and a psychologist in each faculty. And the the access for service is very high. The demand is very high. Even uh, the queue is very, very, very long. So we increase up it uh, at the number and the number, the number again of the psychologist and after the peer counselor. So, so uh, we have, uh, we have aim to have like, uh, maybe ambitious number, but maybe ten percent of all the students being trained to be a peer counselor in the in the near future, because the demand and is very high. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does any uh, other uh, has no? Okay, then uh, let me ask uh, one question, another, the other question from Carlos Urrutia to Tania this time is uh, related to the engagement issue within the mental health apps. Uh, has there been any actions taken to encourage more engagement? Um, well, I, in the research that I did looking at app use, um, we were really just interested in people's real world use and I think apps are very easy to delete um, so we weren't running a trial I know that the trials that I have done at on websites and I have actually done other studies and been involved in other studies that have assessed websites we generally tend to get very high dropout rates with online interventions and digital interventions anyway and that's even in a research trial where you have people emailing constantly um, email support, text support, um, there just is really a high rate of dropout. So the short answer to that is um, yes and, and no. Um, no, I haven't actually assessed more engagement around apps, um, but I know that the studies that have increased engagement, I don't know if it's been successful. Um, I don't know how to increase engagement. I think it would be useful if you're a clinician working with someone with an app. And I know that when I work with clients with bipolar disorder, we often use mood monitoring apps. And that's something we work on together. And I think that increases engagement when you're coming to a session with a therapist, you're talking through the app with the therapist, you're much more likely to engage and continue to use the app, I think. Um, but when I think we're left to our own devices, like everything, exercise, diet, <laughs> and no one's watching, we stop using it. So that, that's just my thoughts, Carlos. I don't know if that answers what you are wanting to know more about. I don't know. Uh, let, uh, Carlos Urrutia, uh, let, let, can, uh, can you uh, tell us if uh, uh, the answer from Tanya uh, is well. He answered first. Uh, uh, thank and thanking all of you for the answer. And thank you. I would like to thank you, Carlos Urrutia, uh, for for your questions too. Um, now uh, I would like uh, uh, to 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 say. Uh, uh, uh the question the answers uh isabel uh the the answers for from our uh question to the audience uh and and then if we now can uh, uh share the screen of it we can see that so the question was through which activities is your university addressing mental health and there are some uh, uh, regarding projects to engage students around the topic, awareness raising campaign. There are some 
also in research projects or surveys and supporting services for uh, students and that's in person and also online uh, uh, more in person than online uh, supporting services for students and also trainings and events uh, directed at uh, staff uh, if you can see it's uh, on one side rarely or not and uh, by the uh, uh, right side is on a regular uh, basis. Uh, would you like to, as a panelist, comment uh, on some of the answers that we got from the audience? Is that uh, the uh, uh, situation in your university? Yeah, that if you had to answer this, that you couldn't because you were speaking, but if uh, you had to answer to uh, this uh, uh, this poll uh, question, would you answer uh, more or less the same? Uh, no, I think that it's, it's the same that in our university, uh, there's, a lot, there's more service uh, in person that that online services for students to improve the their mental health, and I think I think that in the nowadays nowadays uh, we have more projects in that engage students in the mental health topics. Yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, is is more. Uh, it's three is the maximum. Isabel is is telling us that in the chat. One is none, two is a little bit, and three is uh, uh, a lot. And then uh, it's 2.2 .2 for supporting services for students in person. And online is 1.9. It's around two anyway uh, uh, in both cases. And you, Mauricio, said that uh, it's a kind of relation from one to three. Maybe online is not so common and uh, in person is more common. Is that what you are saying? Okay. Um, that's the other way around in the Open University of Catalonia because we don't have oh, just a small uh, uh, in-person support uh, mental health for students. It's a uh, it's uh, an online uh, an online support, and uh, really we found uh, really a very huge use from uh, PhD students, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, already mentioned in the literature that they have six times more risk to have anxiety, to suffer from anxiety and depression than uh, um, regular population. Tania, you were about to say something. Oh, I was just agreeing with you, Marta. I think the data is very consistent with how I would rate too. I think there's room for improvement, isn't there? Um, I okay. feel like we're doing a lot, but I think we could do more. And that's kind of what I felt with that data. Um, okay. Otherwise, it would be all threes, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> We had we had thirty three replies. That's not uh, no, not a, enough. Not representative bad. enough. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> but, it, but it's okay. It's representative from this panel. I mean, uh, uh, so uh, 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 there's somebody asking. Uh, oh, Isabel is asking about you. That you mentioned also survey to students earlier. Could you share with everyone the results yes. of or, or if available? I'm happy to do that. I have the DIY here because oh, I wasn't, wasn't sure if anyone would be interested. So there's the DIY to that article that I was talking about that talks about okay. the survey results. It's one okay. of the papers I've done, um, but okay, I've done a few you. more. So if you follow that DIY, hopefully it will help. So thank you very much. That was very, very, very useful. So now uh, we are just uh, a few minutes left for, for, for this webinar. And I would like to uh, ask you, the panelists, one key learning, insight or question or call to action, whatever you like, uh, emerging from uh, uh, emerging from this webinar or from your experience. So I would like just uh, a 30 second or one minute it, uh, and then I, I will close uh, the webinar. So let's start uh, with uh, Diana, uh, maybe she left. Oh, 
Oh yeah, I, I don't see her. Uh, 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 maybe she had some problems with it. Then, uh, uh, then Mauricio, Mauricio Castaño, please. Uh, can we share? Can you share with us uh, uh, one key learning insight, question, or uh, a call to action, uh, final uh, take home message that you like to share? Well, a key sentences uh, to prevent is to ask. Yeah. I think that is a good sentence because the families or family members of a patient uh, with depression or INC, they they sometimes are afraid to ask what happened to you. So my key sentences sentence is to prevent is to ask. Great, thank you. Uh, then uh, Carlos Contreras, uh, please, if you want to share. Uh, your final thought with us? Yes, thank you. I will say that uh, uh, universities have a, a lot of responsibilities on this uh, improving of mental health, especially with the new technologies, and to reduce uh, social inequalities in mental, in mental health access. And we need also to recognize that we are in, uh, we are researching some very interesting questions from this uh, uh, scientific point of view uh, and complex questions so we need more uh, support from our governments and between us to build a better uh, bridge better, better connections and um, thank you very much for this uh, very very helpful uh, webinar Thank you. Then uh, it's your turn, uh, Tania Perich from uh, um, Western Sydney University, please. Um, I don't know if I have a call to action, but I took notes of what <laughs> I would like to read up on more after this. And I loved this idea of thinking about interventions, uh, from looking at it from a family perspective and looking at the systems. And I think that with technology, we very much target individuals. And I don't know if there's a way to think about that a little bit more. And that was something I really thought about. Um, and so I loved the comments around family, social support. And I really loved some of the work that Sophia is doing around VR. I thought that was really exciting and really interesting. Um, everyone's work is exciting and interesting. But that's all I, I took away. Everyone's work is exciting and interesting. <laughs> and I'll read more about everyone. So. Yes, thank you. Definitely. So, so Sophia Seinfeld, uh, your 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 message uh, or key learning or insight or whatever you like to share. Yeah, given the the high burden we have of mental health uh, issues, uh, yeah, maybe I just have like a reflection that is like uh, maybe we need to research how uh, emerging technologies. Uh, that are evolving very quickly in other commercial applications might actually help us uh, to improve the healthcare uh, problems. So basically just a call to action to do more research into these topics and, and really understand how these technologies may, might benefit us. Yeah, wow. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you. I want to express my, my gratitude to all the speakers from Australia, Mexico, Colombia, Indonesia, and Catalonia, and uh, to all uh, to all uh, the audience from all these countries and above. Uh, so it's now 1.30 in the, in the morning in Sydney. Uh, in Jakarta is 9.30 p.m., and Mexico and Bogota, you have to start now the day. It's 8, 8, 8.30 and 9.30 in the morning. So in this in this virtual space, we have witnessed uh, the fusion uh, of this global and different time zones perspective on, on building resilience in a changing world, definitely. Uh, and so I think the insights shared uh, uh, today uh, for me, underscore the transformative potential of, of digital solutions in mental health because transcending geographical barriers. So let's carry these discussions for, forward beyond the confines of our screens, I would say, and uh, fostering collaborative efforts um, 
that prioritize inclusivity and cultural sensitivity. So the, ch the challenges are for sure universal, universal. And, uh, and our cooperation, I would say, is our our strength. So thank you very much again to all of you for your valuable contributions, uh, both uh, pa panelists and um, uh, participants. So and uh, let the connections made today fool the future endeavors uh, towards a world where mental health will be knows no borders. Thanks a lot. <laughs>